the workshop, the training, or whatever that is. Here's a. All right. Thank you, members of the board, uh, the ones that are here for us tonight. Um, obviously, we like to kind of keep you trained up, and since you don't do this every day, uh, we've been busy. Uh, we had a number of cases last time, which is highly uh, unusual for us here in Capel. Uh, normally, we maybe meet once or twice a year, but we've met fairly often in, within the last 12 months. Uh, so I, I wanted to go over some just basic things with you. I've got some stuff that I'm going to give you tonight since we're talking about a variance, and it's got the definition of a variance. Got a, so I'm going to give you those cheat sheets that you can keep with you. Uh, so when you come back next time, when maybe it might be three months or four months from now, you'll have your cheat sheet with you that you can take and say a variance is, and this is or is not one of those six things. Uh, so we'll we'll go over those, and then I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that that's um, come to the fore uh, a little more, and we may see, and that's uh, the idea of a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disability Act and the Fair Housing Act, uh, which is something I've never really talked to you about. We've talked around it. I talk to staff about it occasionally because we see it at staff level, but you normally don't see that in your case tonight has that element in it, and, and I want to uh, assuade you from worrying about it because what we have is not an accommodation issue. It's a business that's a lawful business because the state law says it has to be a law, but it's a lawful home occupation. So this isn't we're really accommodating the applicants, the owner of the facility, and so that's not the accommodation. Uh, the accommodation would be, and, and, and well, I'll just get into that. But let, let's start with a general overview. Uh, the Board of Adjustment is a statutory board that is provided for in the Zoning Enabling Act in Texas. Uh, it's uh, set forth in Chapter 211, uh, basically point zero zero seven zero zero eight and zero zero nine deal with the Board of Adjustment. And the idea of the Board of Adjustment is the fact that, you know, when city zones property, they do so in mass, and so it's a regulation that applies to all the property of the city uh, in various zones, in the industrial district, the residential district, commercial and retail, uh, neighborhood services, the various districts that each city has, and they have uses, and they make setback requirements, uh, front yard requirements, uh, rear yard requirements, side uh, they have height restrictions. They have various regulations that govern each and every use that's allowed in each and every district. And those regulations deal with uh, uh, the mass of the building, the size of the building, the location of the building, et cetera. And when they do that in Moss, they don't do every, each and every, and look at each and every parcel of property within that district. They write those regulations. The property is developed in accordance with those regulations. So when it's platted and uh, buildings are constructed on it, they recognize those side yard setbacks, et cetera. Over time, and, uh, things change. Trees grow. Creeks change. Uh, cities exercise their eminent domain or uh, widen the street, uh, a building is torn down, another one put in its place, and zoning districts change. And as a result of all those things, property owners over time uh, want to not change the use, but either in, take that use and change the configuration of the activity or the buildings that are located on that. And so what you are tasked with doing is saying, is this property and the owner's use of that property, should there be a variance to those regulations because of uh, circumstances surrounding how that property now lays on the ground and how it's configured in the building that's within the envelope on that land. And so a variance is really authorized under state law for the purpose of determining if, it, if the property now creates hardship for example, we have a number of homes in town that back up to 
creeks and tributaries to the Elm Fork. And over time, uh, erosion or the change in the velocity of the stream will change the configuration of the creek. And the creek may erode someone's backyard. So now their 40-foot rear yard requirement, because of that change in condition of the property, because where it's located, they no longer have 40 feet, but they have 38 and a half feet. And so can that property owner build in that backyard uh, when he had 40 feet, he had enough uh, space to do it, but now he only has 38, so he may not have enough space to do it. So does that create a hardship? Not because of anything they have done, but because of the topography or how the property lies and the zoning regulations that were in place on that property that are applicable. So that's what your job is, is to uh, hear evidence as you would in a court, all the witnesses, everybody that talks to you about the case tonight has to be sworn in, they have to take an oath, and you're entitled to rely and judge their credibility just like you were a judge or a jury uh, in a courtroom, and then make a determination if they're requesting a variance, have they proven uh, their case uh, to you that uh, what they are asking for is based on a condition, a unique condition on the property that makes the otherwise applicable side yard setback, rear yard setback, um, um, a hardship on them to enjoy the use of their property. Uh, last time we had a case with a property owner, I think it was in Copperstone, and that was requesting that he be allowed, that uh, he and his wife be allowed to build or finish out basically and with an outdoor kitchen and I think there was a fireplace and an arbor and, and eat into the side yard setbacks. Uh, what was unique about that property, and unfortunately for the property owner, they could not demonstrate that because of its topography or because of the condition of the property as uh, they purchased that there was a hardship created. Let's take, for example, in that case. If the city had, through, uh, through eminent domain, increased the size of the uh, cul-de-sac, and therefore, his, he didn't have 20 feet anymore, he only had 10, and he wanted to do something. That's a hardship that he did not create. It was based now on the, on the, the concept that the city came in and actually uh, acquired some more property and ate into their side yard setback. Uh, if you remember the Ansari case, there was nothing, the lot size had not changed, nothing had changed about that. Uh, so that they were not allowed, and in that case, that property owner was not allowed, nor did you find that there was an appropriate hardship that was created because of something that occurred through no fault of their own, either through nature or through some act of a governmental entity uh, or some other circumstance which created that hardship for them. As you know, the hardship cannot be of financial nature. You can't, you know, the, the case tonight... Uh, has a lot of elements that, well, they need an extra room because they want more uh, residents to uh, um, house at that facility. And because they, they can or they can't convert this part of the house, part of the structure, to living quarters instead of parking, uh, that's a hardship for them. Well, that's self-imposed hardship, and that's an economic hardship. The case law tells us that those are not hardships upon which a variance is appropriate or should be granted. So those hardships have to do the, with the uniqueness of the property and not with uh, the circumstances of the owner. And many times people come down here and want you to exercise your discretion in their favor and grant them a variance based on what they want to do, not based on the condition of the, of the land. Uh, Susan and I tried to steer them that way, but just like down at the courthouse, you get to pay your money and you get to take your chances. And, and the, so we're, we're not gatekeepers. When Susan denies or Suzanne denies a permit 
for an applicant and explains to them that they're they can't use the rear yard or it's too high or the circumstances that the building envelope will not entertain their expansion of their use on the property uh, through structure uh, that they have the right to come to you to ask for a variance but she I know explains to them when she writes to them and tells them if they want to go that route she gives them the benefit of her experience and the benefit of sitting in here listening to you and then runs it by me and then we send it on to the property owner in many cases they still want to come here and tell their story and seek relief from you um, so as you know when you so you receive evidence uh, you deliberate and talk about that evidence as you did last time on each one of those cases and discuss the merits of of the request and you discuss what the conditions of the land are that would either support or not support the request for the relief by the property owner. Um, after you deliberate, I ask you always to make a motion to grant the variance because of the four-fifths requirement. It requires four out of five of you to grant a variance uh, to the zoning regulations. So uh, tonight, since you only have four of you, it has to be unanimous. Uh, so we still, even though we're, we, we have a quorum, uh, but any action you take tonight uh, to um, uh, consider granting a, a variance will take a unanimous vote of all of you. Uh, I have had cases where uh, the applicant will ask for a continuance uh, instead of their presentation so that there's a full board that's your discretion because you can grant the re you have enough to grant the relief and hear the case uh, but I'll leave that up to you so you have that discretion if you want the fifth member to be present um, to hear the case you certainly have that ability uh, to do so if you desire to uh, just because they ask for the continuance don't doesn't mean you have to grant it so um, and feel free to stop me if you know say wait a minute I, I'm confused so that's one of the that's the primary purpose of the Board of Adjustment is not to rewrite the zoning ordinance if uh, whatever the rules are are the rules uh, you didn't make the rules the council made the rules uh, your job is only to determine if there's a factual underpinning on this piece of property that make that rule a hardship on the property owner now <clears throat> a lot of people that now own homes since our city's been pretty much built out now for about 10 years um, they may not have been here when the zoning and bought the property but they bought the property we assume that we all know the bounty of our uh, uh, decisions when we buy land and we know what the setbacks and the side yard requirements and the rear yard and the height and building materials and all the things that go with that are when we buy property at least we're presumed to know that although uh, if you're like any other property owner you probably did not read your full title document uh, when when you got your title insurance or read every page and every line of the deed restrictions if you live in in, in a in a development that has deed restrictions which are a lot of our property but only find out later that uh, or read the zoning ordinance or the subdivision ordinance when you buy property we all probably should do that I'm kind of a geek about that thing so I do those things because I do it for a living so or insomnia or you're just yeah or there's something else wrong with you so you know that's just yeah what you do is you your due diligence is you go through the neighborhood and look uh, most property owners or people that buy look at the neighborhood and assume that everybody acts in similar fashion to see what this person has or that person has um, and etc so um, like I say you take evidence uh, you're entitled to ask questions of the applicant uh, they should answer those questions uh, I will not sit here and tell you not to ask questions one of the issues that you have you got to be careful of with this ADA stuff is that you have now put 
yourselves in a position to start asking questions about things that are really not relevant. Like, if someone has a special need, I'm wheelchair bound, okay? That's relevant to your decision. If I need a ramp on the front of my house because I am in a wheelchair or my son or daughter is in a wheelchair, that evidence should be presented to you and, I, and it's appropriate for you to ask a question is, is it a permanent situation? How long will the person uh, be wheelchair bound? Because you can make decisions and put conditions on granting the, these changes so that when the condition is abated, you remember the Ansaris had an uh, issue with one of their children uh, uh, had a skin condition that required them to have the cover uh, that they wanted to construct on the side of the house that violated the side yard setback. There was no doctor's evidence that was presented. I didn't need to know what, and that's, I think what you needed or what you felt you needed from that standpoint is not someone's subjective testimony, but a testimony of an expert. But I will steer you away from, or you should steer for starting examining either the mother or the father about their child and their medical condition uh, and, and get into those issues because then that could be uh, either, one, an embarrassing thing, or two, an irrelevant thing, and three, it looks like there's an animus against people with disabilities, and that's what we're trying to avoid. The real question is, does that homeowner need that accommodation for what period of time, for the condition, the physical or mental condition that they're in at that time? And we've dealt with this I haven't dealt with it here specifically on a, your level. I have dealt with it on staff level. And most people that have, we had a, a conversion case on part of someone's house. And they we wrote in there that when they either sold the house, it had to be removed, or when the person no longer lived at the premise, that that accommodation was removed. Uh, so that we didn't create a problem because we we do know this that you know when you change the homes and the businesses and the buildings that violate the there's a reason for these side yard setbacks and rear yard setbacks and and height restrictions is for some uniformity and and to make the neighborhood I don't want to say trashy or not trashy but to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood and the integrity of the, of the zone uh, that uh, these properties are located. Because we write these regulations for each use, for retail uses or commercial uses or industrial uses. So we want them to all maintain, there's some safety issues involved in, in keeping buildings away from each other so they don't create overcrowding. I mean, if you ever looked at New York in 1870 and what that looked like, New York City, uh, with tenement houses on top or old London, uh, you can see without these kinds of regulations what happens. And you're the stewards and keepers of the flame on that. Uh, it's not inappropriate if you see something that, that uh, you think ought to be changed is to let staff know and we'll certainly run it through the planning department and bring it to the council's attention if we're if we're seeing the same issue over and over again that's an indication that maybe what was once i mean our zoning ordinance is 30 years old and you know there's new materials and the uses have changed and definitions have changed so, you know, we owe it to, to the citizens to maybe revisit our zoning ordinance. And, you know, you play a role in that because you interpret it. But if, you know, it's not your job to change it on Thursday night. Uh, so, do you have any questions so far? Yes? Yeah, because you're being recorded. I just have a logistical question. I know that you said sometimes we can... Um, 
make a motion to approve or deny a variance, or we can also make a motion to approve the variance with certain conditions. Yes. Would it make sense to first have a motion to approve or deny and then do a motion? Like if it fails, then do a motion to approve I, with conditions? I gener- or just- you will generally have a feel for that when you deliberate amongst yourselves. Okay. When someone says, you know, I don't mind, you know, I got some issues because of the way the tree and the grove of trees, which, by the way, is a condition of the property, and especially if there's native trees. Uh, there's a famous uh, variance case that involved a, what I call a historic or a specimen tree, depending on your It was like 40 feet in diameter, and it was like 110 years old. They had an arborist testify. And and it was growing on the property. And so as a result of where it was on the property, it ate up most of the backyard. So it affected the setbacks in the backyard. And they granted the variance on that. And the city sued their own board of adjustment, which they can do. And they upheld that as saying that that was a condition of the land. It wasn't created by the owner. The tree was there before the property was ever built. And it's like a creek. And so that was a good variance. So you may have, if the tree died, let, let's, let's hope it doesn't because it was 120 years old. But if the tree died and then it was removed, that would be, I could see you talking about that. Well, if the tree's there, I get it. But what happens when the tree goes? Maybe then at that point, then the need for the variance would go away and maybe the the, the property should be returned to the same condition it was in without the tree. And that would be, or like in the reasonable accommodation uh, scenario I gave you, when, when the condition of the owner of the property would either change or they no longer own the property or sold the property to a third party, then the, the ramp would go away in the illustration I gave you before uh, in the front of the house because that would be a structure that's not allowed by because it violates the, um, there's a, uh, an ADA case that comes to mind that uh, the person that lived in the house had uh, m- mobility issues, and so they didn't allow, they had rear yard or rear entry um, um, driveway. And they wanted a front entry driveway because of it allowed the person easier to get in the house. And so they said that that was a reasonable accommodation is to allow a front entry driveway in that location. Um, now, the facts were, you're thinking in cop terms, most rear, <laughs> most rear entry homes are easier to get into than front entry homes. <laughs> here just because we have had alleys for so many years and and the the way the the garages and everything are. But that was an example that they also said that when that person no longer lived there, then the property had to be returned to the condition that was in prior to the person with a disability that needed the mobility uh, accommodation or modification. But I... If I'm here, I'll help you do that. But I think by your discussion, if one of you, if some of you start going, well, I like it, but it's when you hear the buts is where the conditions come in. And then I think that you have to look at can the condition have a time on it, a time period, or uh, and that's a condition or an element that, that, can, that a hardship then is relieved if necessary in that accommodation or if <clears throat> say the I was giving an example where the creek may have moved and taken up someone's backyard if the creek were straightened out and there was say the Army Corps of Engineers come in there and said that we've got to clean that erosion up and they go in there and put in a gabion wall and backfill it well you don't have the issue anymore and so then the variance could be granted subject to it not being reclaimed. That's reasonable. Because what I do is I'll write up your determination. When you make a motion, there's then a, or I will generate an order that will be signed by the chairman, which will, and then I file it in the deed records for that property. So once a variance is granted, it goes with the property. It doesn't go with the owner. 
if you start putting those conditions to relieve, then a new owner is put on notice, uh, and that's why we do that, so that we're, you're not here hearing the same case or the same problem again. Uh, and then the building officials uh, of the city can issue a permit. Um, and so. is that the kind of thing that an, a new home purchaser would find out when they run have the title run? That's the kind of thing that would pop up and it would say, yep. hey, it's this a, condition is on here. It, there's a condition that you, you have a 40-yard setback and you've granted a 5-foot variance, so you actually have 35 feet. And then they will see the document, and the title company would, because your zoning regulations or deed restrictions on the property show up and things like that. So it's, it's an exclusion or an exception, depending on what the condition is in your title policy. If you don't do anything else, just read Schedule B. That's all the things you can't do on your land or special conditions on your land that you need to know about. When we make a motion, yes. um, does it have to be in the form of I make a motion to approve the requested variance or deny, or can it just be I make a motion Same. that we vote? It's a, they, the, the applicant has asked you to grant the variance. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you to make a motion to grant the variance, and oh. the reason is Three people could vote for it, which under normal circumstances would tell us that something passes three out of five, but not with y'all. It has to be four out of five. So I always ask you to stay in the affirmative. Maybe just leave then there. that way, if it only if the votes are one in favor, four against, it's denied. If it's th two in favor, three uh, against, you know. It's denied. You got to get to four positives. And if you never make four positives, and then you don't have to, because if the motions deny and it fails, that doesn't mean that four of you are in favor of granting it. It just means the motion to deny is passed. So it, yeah, that was a because, little confusing. It, 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 it was a, a little confusing last it's time. A, mm -hmm. It's a goofy lawyer thing. Okay. That's all I can tell you. And. And that's the way I write the order, that the motion was to grant the variance, and it failed, and therefore the order is it's denied, or if it doesn't reach the 75% hallmark. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I know it's confusing. I, I try to get the council to do that, and they never listen. So, And it's on zoning cases, because then they get confused. No means yes, and yes means no when you do that. So then the people that vote, if every, you know what, if all seven of them and all five of you knew you were not going to grant this and it was obvious, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at that point. It's only when there starts to be a divergence of opinion that I see from you all that it becomes confusing. If everybody hates it and, all, and each commissioner as they deliberate says, no, 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 I, I can't support this, then it less important but if some of you say I like it and some of you say I don't like it now it may become a problem and how you're voting and then you become confused I would just like to you know thank you for the clarification on on you know the overall oversight of the Board of Adjustment uh, I you know for me it clarifies maybe some of the subjective nature that I was maybe conflicted with a little bit. And uh, moving forward, uh, you know, it's, it's going to help me out with my decision. And, and you know, it, it's difficult. I, I do this. I, I don't do the, the normal work like I do here for University Park. I do the Board of Adjustment cases. And, you know, there's people or they have, they have means and they do some and propose some very nice things for some very beautiful homes. And they, they take no quarter. They don't care how nice it looks. They don't care how much money they've spent. And I mean, and they have some homes that have some, you know, were designed by some historic architects in Dallas. 
and they want to preserve that house, and a lot of them are getting older. I mean, you know, most of the houses in University Park are mm, 180, 90 years old. And so, you know, they want to modernize them and do some things with them and add a floor on them and do some height things. And their Board of Adjustment says, you know, our job is to keep the flame and you are not there. And I, sometimes I'm shocked because some of the stuff they do is just outstanding. <laughs> they, some of those people spend a lot of money on some very nice current architects that are very, very good and make some of those homes just even more beautiful than they already are. But they said, you know, it's too high on that side and the people that live next door bought that house and that's the height requirement. And so, sorry. Okay. So, um, one of the things with accommodations, we'll, we'll try to keep you focused on that. Uh, if that becomes an issue, um, you know, generally most of the conditions or accommodations for us here at the city or for a business that has these same obligations uh, is that those over the life of the building is usually a temporary condition. Um, so um, those are things that that I think that y you can. You know, if someone needs a ramp, how long, you know, the ramp should go away when the people that live there no longer need it. And so, and that's not inappropriate. Uh, and if we get into that, we'll, we'll help you out as much as we can. So, okay, thank you. I'll let you get to your regular business. Thank you, Mr. Hager. Um, So now we're on to the. Um, okay. Uh, now we're over to the um, regular session. Um, item number four: We have citizens' appearance. Um, everybody here is going to speak before the board tonight. Okay. Um, is there anybody on Zoom tonight? Okay. Are they going to be testifying? On? Yes, we will have people testifying via Zoom. Okay, I guess what we'll do is when we get when we hear from them, we'll we'll swear them in as as they speak. Okay. But for everybody else, if y'all would stand up, please raise your right hand and, and take take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the Board of Adjustments is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Sit down, please. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so f uh, we have um, we have to consider an approval of the uh, of uh, the minutes first of all for May six to twenty twenty one. Has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, I'll entertain a mo. Anybody have any any changes that they want to make on the minutes or anything? Or no. No. Everybody, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the minutes. Oh, okay. Motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay. Minutes are approved. I skipped uh, item number five, so let's go ahead and uh, let's speak about this. Well, we have to, uh, resignation of board member Laura Ketchum, and uh, we would like to uh, appoint the alternate board member, Casey Smith, as, as, uh, as a regular board member. Does anybody have any uh, any? Uh, thoughts on that? Or, uh, I support that recommendation, okay. as do I. All right. Uh, so all in favor of, of uh, Casey Smith being a re regular member, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Casey Smith. He's not here. In the back. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, now we have a public hearing to consider the approval of a variance from Section 12-4- I'm sorry, Excuse me, 12 12 4 of the City of Coppell zoning ordinance to allow the conversion of a two car garage into habitable space by eliminating the two required enclosed parking spaces on the property located 800 East Parkway Boulevard, that would be Meadows Floor Block L, Lot 22, as requested by owner Jack Leathers. Now, uh, before we get started, I want to take a minute. 
and talk about variances a little bit. Variances, um, what we here at the board do is that, um, and you probably have come in on some of this meeting, we, uh, a variance is defined as permission to depart from the literal requirements of a zoning ordinance by virtue of a unique hardship uh, due to special circumstances regarding the person's property. Okay. Um, now, it's a property hardship, and it's, and it's usually it's a waiver of strict requirements of the zoning ordinance. And administra uh, uh, so the theory of a variance is to kind of relax the strict requirements in situations with because of u unusual circumstances, there's, you can't use the property. Um, so variances are, are only, we're only allowed to, uh, to allow a variance if strict application of the zoning ordinance in place would cause an unnecessary hardship. And so when we consider uh, con applications for variances, the board, we have to, we have to consider uh, some evidence of a property hardship. And so, so variance is not authorized merely to accommodate highest and best use of a property, but when the zoning ordinance doesn't permit any reasonable use of the lot. Uh, and so when we, so when we as the board determine whether or not a hardship exists, we, 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 we think about things like, is the hardship self-imposed? You can't, you know, we can't grant it for a self-imposed hardship. Is the hardship unique to the property? For example, as I think we mentioned earlier, if you get um, erosion from a lot where you had at one time enough space and now you don't, that would be a hardship that's not self-imposed. That's That comes with the land. If the hardship is can't be financial in nature, and the hardship doesn't include uh, property that cannot be used for highest and best use or frustrated development objectives, now we need to have a, a vote of four to grant any variance. And since we're only got four here, it's going to be a, we're going to need a unanimous vote. Um, so at this point, what we're going to do, we're going to hear from chief building official. And uh, we'll hear, and then we'll hear from the applicant. Suzanne, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight's public hearing is for the property located at 800 East Parkway Boulevard. Board, I would like to admit the following slides and the accompanying memo into evidence for this case. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to accept, we'll accept your slides as evidence. Thank you. This request is to allow for a garage conversion. The entirety of the existing two-car garage would be remodeled into a bedroom and bathroom, leaving no enclosed parking spaces on the property. The ordinance that is the subject of this variance request requires two enclosed, meaning garage parking spaces, per house. Section 1212.4 of the Code of Ordinance reads, Parking Regulations, two enclosed parking spaces per unit behind the front yard line. Off-street parking spaces shall be provided in accordance with the requirements of special uses set forth in Article 31. Where lots are adjacent to an alley, the enclosed parking area garage must be accessed off of the alley only. This is a corner house located at the northeast corner of East Parkway Boulevard and Meadow Run. It is in a single family subdivision with rear entry garages off of alleyways. The zoning for this property is SF9 with no additional plan development standards. Here are some photos of the house. It's a brick home with similar features to the surrounding residences. The garage is on the rear and the driveway connects to the alley. According to the Dallas County uh, Appraisal District, the house is listed as being just over 2,000 square feet in total. It's listed as having three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a two-car garage, although the applicant's plans show four bedrooms. It appears that one space has been repurposed. The house was constructed in the mid-'80s. Uh, the applicant is open to leaving the garage door in place to maintain the same appearance as it is today. What's unique about this property is its use. The house has been converted into a residential assisted living facility for elderly women who can no longer live independently. 
using a single family home as this kind of care facility is actually allowed by right under Texas state law. Such residential facilities are regulated by the Texas Department of Health and Human Services. The use as a care facility is not prohibited or regulated by the city. It does not affect the zoning. It does not become a commercial property. For all intents and purposes, residential care facilities like this are still treated as single family houses in the eyes of city law. That said, certain additional building codes and regulations do come into play and the owners have endeavored to satisfy those requirements. Those changes include, but are not limited to, adding a fire sprinkler and alarm system and modifying the existing bathrooms and access points to comply with handicap accessibility standards. The building code considerations have been addressed separately. I must emphasize that the use of the property is allowed and is not the subject of this hearing. Only the request to convert the garage into additional space for tenants. The applicant filed for a building permit on February 25th of this year. Staff informed the applicant in writing that the permit was denied on March 2nd because of the ordinance requiring the two, car two garage parking spaces. In the past, those seeking to do garage conversions could stay on the right side of the law if they have or build an additional two-car garage on the property. In this case, they did not apply to build an additional two-car garage with this permit due to site constraints. The average two-car garage is approximately 20 by 20, and the required setback between a garage and the rear property line is 20 feet. In the case of this property, that distance is really just a little over 30 feet, so you couldn't fit another two-car garage tacked on to the house as it stands. The ordinance in question is essentially a parking ordinance. Our parking ordinances aim to provide adequate off-street parking for every property without relying on on-street or off-site parking. The applicant point, points out that the residents who live here do not drive, and there is a minimal need for staff parking, and we could presume that staff could park on the driveway. Visitors, such as family or medical personnel, would park on the street. If approved, the proposed garage conversion would be made to comply with all other codes and ordinances. The board may choose to approve, deny, modify, or attach conditions. If the board chooses to approve this variance, staff recommends that you stipulate that the variance terminates if or when the use as a care facility ends or if the property reverts back to a typical single family residence. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the applicant, Mr. Leathers, has prepared a short PowerPoint presentation as well to further explain his case. When you open this to public hearing, I recommend that you call upon Mr. Leathers as your first speaker, and I will queue up his presentation for him. With that, do you have any questions for staff? No. no. Oh. Okay, we'll open up... Uh the, the, the public hearing, um, Mr. Leathers? Could the booth please queue up the other presentation? Just, would you step up to the podium, Thank you. State? Sure. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Jan Leathers, 615 Cane Mount Lane. Thank you. Coppell. Jack Leathers, same location. Thank you. Do you have a uh, PowerPoint presentation? We do. It should be displayed. Okay. Can you go to the second page, please? My name is... <laughs> Sorry, can you do that? Um, my name is Jan Leathers, and I have been a Coppell resident for about 27 years now. I moved here from Georgia when I got married, and um, uh, we have raised our children here. We've lived here, um, like I said, for 27 years. Um, 
I opened this home because my mom came to live with us in about 2011, and she lived with us in our house. Um, up until that point, I was able to take care of her because physically she was in good condition. She had a problem with dementia. Um, so when after she fell, um, of course, she went into the hospital, and then we tried to find an assisted li She went through the rehab process, and then we tried to find an assisted living, or she wasn't a candidate for a nursing home, so we focused on assisted livings. But the problem with assisted living was she needed a higher level of care than they could give to her. Like, as you probably know, if you've looked in assisted livings, they have a ratio of anywhere from 10 to 12 residents, up to 20 residents per caregiver. And that just was not going to be an option for my mom. I would have had to hire 24-7 care. So I found out about these residential care homes because my friend had her dad in one. And initially, um, there was one group home that I did put my mom in, in Coppell, but um, it was a good concept, but um, I had to move her out because um, it just wasn't up to my standards, if you will. They weren't taking care of my mom as well as I would hope they would have. But anyway, being a realtor, I purchased this home in Coppell with my friend um, that is in the healthcare field. So um, I couldn't have done it without her. And my cousin is a neurologist that specializes in geriatric neurology. So between all those things that just came together, initially it was supposed to be a place for my home, my mom to have care for her dementia. And she was physically, like I said, in good condition. But the problem was I couldn't take her to my home and she needed a higher level of care than I could give her. So with that said, I hired a caregiver, and it just grew organically. The more people I talked to, the more there was a need for it. By the way, we only take female residents at this home. <laughs> and, um, and so many people were, like, excited about the fact that I didn't expect it to grow this much, but there is, and my husband can speak to this, there's a major need in Coppell for a care homes such as ours. And the resident to caregiver ratio is no more than three residents per caregiver. And like at any one time, we normally will have two caregivers in the home. And it's 24-7 personalized care. I can tell you all about the facilities and, you know, how they didn't provide the personalized care. It was scheduled. And if you go in and you want to get a, like, they need to give you a shower in the morning, then you're going to get a shower. You can't get one. And, and if you don't like their food, you know, you don't eat. So um, that's, that's what we also provide is personalized care. Now, I'm going to let my husband speak as to need. So, so as my wife mentioned, you know, we st established Nana's place. She's my sweet mom. Yeah, that's her mother there. Uh, providing 24-7 care services, round-the-clock caregivers there, meals designed for each resident there, uh, personal care plans, we take care of medication, we do all the, the hygiene, as my wife mentioned, and we provide on-site professional services. We have a, a doctor that comes on-site, mobile x-ray that comes if, if somebody has a fall and gets hurt, we take care of all that. So what we're here to ask you for is this variance on the garage. Up, uh, shown on the screen now is the plans. Really what we're, there's a, two things in play here. There's huge increase in demand for these care homes for senior elders and we'll explain more about that demand and how important it is to the city of Capel, and then the increased costs for us to establish this home and then to get licensed and I'll give you some more detail behind that as well it's putting us into a position where we can't operate this care home if we can't allow and accommodate more residents into the home so really it's additional residents driven by demand and the cost to get uh, set up and licensed in the state of Texas. I want to emphasize, like Suzanne mentioned there, that there is no 
we don't believe there's any impact to the concerns Coppell has. We live in Coppell. We understand the concerns. We wouldn't want some garage remodel to happen next door to us if it's going to impact us and, and park and all that. So we're here to share that, first off, well, there is no HOA, so we're not trying to also gain their approval. The garage door will be left in place. So from the street, you won't notice anything there. Driving by, it'll just look like a normal garage. We are adding a door. We have to do that for escape uh, emergency exit purposes. So we are adding a door, but it's from the garage to the inside patio. So again, driving by, you won't even see any changes at all to the outside. And there will be no impact to parking. So as mentioned earlier, our, caregiver, our residents, first of all, can't drive. They're not licensed to drive. The youngest resident we have is? I think 92. 92. So that's the youngest. So they don't drive. Our caregivers don't, typically don't drive. They get they ride share. They get other, other uh, ways to get to the, to the place. They don't own cars. And so we only get occasional visitors, whether it's family members or medical staff coming to check up. We have nurses. We, a couple of our residents are on hospice care, so we have regular daily hospice checkups and so forth like that. There's no permanent parking really going on at our residence. Um, we're also going to make sure that, um, you mentioned a very important point. I know if you pass this, we hope you do, the consideration that you're going to ask for, we can accommodate. So we're totally, our, our plans, I can go back to it, but our plans, we're going to build out a total of false walls inside. So if we ever close the business down or move on, we can deconstruct those walls and return it right back to a garage like it was to begin with. So we're not going to do anything that's permanently prohibiting it from ever becoming a garage again. Again, if we left there, we wouldn't want to have a house. We, we wouldn't want to try to sell a house without a two-car garage in it. So we intentionally designed it such that we'll have inside walls going around the garage door, so the garage door will still be there. So that's real important as well. You saw some of these pictures earlier, but this is kind of what it looked like a view from the back. You can see the, the patio there on the bottom right. Um, the, from the top picture there, there's the alleyway. Again, there will be no change. You drive that alleyway today, and you drive down it, after we finish this, there won't be any change from the street side. The floor plan on the left, you can see where the two areas are. The garage on the top right is where we're looking at repurposing. It's not just really bedrooms. We're gonna, it's going to be repurposed to where we could have beds. If we don't have it, if we empty on a resident, we can make the additional living space. We've talked about spa care. Uh, where they'll, we can uh, get, bring in people to cut hair, wash hair, do, do things like that. So we're going to multi-purpose this space to whatever kind of you know, fits the needs at the moment for us for that. There will be a door added, like I have circled there, that goes from the garage out to the patio. Again, that's just for safety concerns. It's required by the state of Texas. We'll talk about the demand. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, friends, it, we have done virtually no marketing. It's all through word of mouth, friends of friends. As a matter of fact, you'll see this lady. She, she just passed away, and she was two weeks shy of her 103rd birthday. She lived in our home for the past three years. She came from a friend of a friend who um, is now currently a friend. Um, but the need is growing in Coppell. I'll just highlight a few of the things on the slide. 35% of Texans age 60 and older have one or more disability. 2010, there were 305,000 people age 85 or older. That's expected to grow to 1.6 million in 2050. That's 500% growth. If you think there's not a need, I can assure you there is because these baby boomers are getting older, and um, it's a real demand. Um, so. so I think the important takeaway here is the, boomy, the boomer market, boomer generation is aging. We probably mm -hmm. all have parents in that category. Um, it's causing this exponential growth. The healthcare system today cannot accommodate that volume of 
people requiring care, whether that's a it's assisted living place like St. Joseph or other areas like that, they just can't accommodate the volume of aging uh, people coming into the to the or needing this type of care. So they're looking at 500 percent growth in just a matter of 25 years. So there's huge demand um, for this kind of need. And what's important to you to consider here is this next slide. These are the care homes today. So if you have an aging resident and you need a care home, like my wife did with her mother, here's kind of your options. You're in Dallas, you're in pretty decent shape. Plano, Fort Worth, but look what's at the bottom of the market. There's two residential care homes today in Coppell. That's it. So we're, we're really kind of behind, from a city standpoint, we're kind of behind in offering this type of service for um, the residents of, Co the families of Coppell. So if you have, if you live in Coppell, you need to have an aging p parent, you probably, you might get lucky and find one vacant bedroom in the two homes more likely you have to go to a neighboring city. Um, the cost of, you know, Coppell by nature, the cost of homes is somewhat prohibitive. And then without the ability to ex use your garage for extra residential care, it really becomes an, a blocker for other residential homes to open up and kind of relieve the stress or the demand for the homes in Coppell. Uh, we have a four bedroom house today and the other house, which is called Four Seasons, they also have a four bedroom. They were able to get their garage redone. Somehow they did it without, without uh, uh, being constrained by this. So they do have ability to offer six, six homes, same, type, same size home as ours. Um, that's really the only two options you have available if, you, if you're in Coppell looking for a home for your mother. I want to give you some insight because Suzanne was asking about this process of getting licensed. So state of Texas, Texas Health and Human Services, they, they um, will license a facility like ours. So we are recognized in the state. So if you were looking to place your, your loved one into a home, you would have some, something that you kind of trust that's been certified to do so. So they call it a Type B assisted living facility. That's the application we're applying for today with the state of Texas. And it, to get, to get uh, licensed with Texas, we have to pass several quality standards. First is there's life safety code, which means we have to install a fire alarm and sprinkler system throughout the entire home. That's already installed. We just finished that work this month. We're scheduled. I have in the deck here that we've already been approved by the fire marshal. That got delayed. But we will get approval probably next week or the following week at the very latest by the uh, City of Coppell Fire Marshal as far as fire alarm sprinkler system. We have emergency lighting already installed throughout the house. So if the power goes out, all the exits light up, the hallways light up, people can see the exit. Um, we are working with um, making sure we're, we're addressing all the fire uh, suppression necessary. So in addition to the sprinklers, alarm systems, we're putting on fire retardant paint. So the wood, anything wood would not, would be a slow burn. Um, so that's part of the life safety code, licensing standards to meet the qualifications. Every bedroom has to be a certain size. We're meeting that. Um, every door has to be 32 inch clearance. Well, guess what? Every, a standard door is 32 without the door. As soon as you add that door, that little two inch blocks that. So we're making necessary changes as well to accommodate 32 inch clear gaps so wheelchairs can go through there. Um, all of our caregivers have to be trained. They have to go through a set of training with the state of Texas and get passed and certified. We're going through that process as well. And then we have to turn over all kinds of documentation to the state of Texas to show that we have a process in place. We have a way of proving that we're administering medication. We have a way of proving that we're taking vitals several times a day and that we're doing our job. We have to adhere to the Texas accessibility of standards. We have to add ramps to all the thresholds. We don't, fortunately, we don't have like long stairs and things like that, but every little one inch threshold to go in and out of the house, we do have to have a, a small little ramp to get over that. And we have to add grab bars and all the bathrooms. So we're doing all that. We've already expanded um, our primary bathroom to accommodate wheelchair, roll in shower, et cetera. So we've already invested quite a bit to date. We have more work to do. We estimate we probably put in over $100,000 on top of the cost of the house 
to get it set up and compliant with the state of Texas. This is all done, you know, call it our fault or whatever. It's all done without realizing that that Capel had an ordinance on the garage. We learned that after the fact unexpectedly. So um, that's why we'd already made the investment. We're kind of in a situation where this is very important to us to be a model. So I'm almost done here. Um, hardship, that was the ask. What is our hardship? So we have, as mentioned here, we've purchased this home. There's very few homes of this type. We can't buy, uh, assisted living facility in Texas can't be a two-story home, right? We, we, you're dealing with aging amb ambulatory residents. They need help getting in and out. They're not able to move on their own. So you can't have a two-story house. It has to be a single-story home. Um, there's not too many of those in Coppell. There's a few, but there's not too many. And um, we've, we've, we purchased the one we found was a great house, we thought. And we put in the investments that we mentioned on the last slide, roughly about $100,000 so far, to get this house in, in a position where it can be certified by the state of Texas. Our operating costs, we have 24-7 caregivers around the clock that, that take care of them. We provide custom food plans. So if one, one resident requires only mulch food that we take care of that the other one can eat hamburgers and steak we'll do we'll do that as well um, we take care of all the personal hygiene regular showers bathrooms and so forth like that and we provide on on-site medical care nursing doctors mobile x-ray etc so really the impact is if we can't expand beyond four residents then we really can't continue to operate this this home and we've been forced to close down this place, this home as a resident, as a residential care home in the city of Capel, which they leave you with one. And the families who have their moms living there today would have to go probably outside the city of Capel, Louisville, other areas to find a, a home and relocate their their uh, um, their mother there, and then. Um, the same restriction is going to prevent someone else from coming in and helping Coppell kind of build up this, this necessity of having a few residential care homes for aging parents. So our impact is, you know, given our investment costs and our operating costs, if we can't go beyond four residents today, our model doesn't support that. And then the, we already know there's a huge demand. Coppell needs places like this. So I, I really think indirectly it's going to impact Coppell as far as offering this type of service to re, uh, aging residents. We're asking that you approve this. Again, we want to emphasize there's only two homes. We're one of them. If we go away, there's only one left. We're saying there's no parking impact. That's a big concern of this ordinance is parking. We're telling you there'll be no parking impact. It's going to be visually unchanged from the outside. And we're providing a very high standard of care to residents of Capel or families who has parents here, families in Capel who have parents at our home. So we're providing a very high-end um, service to families of Capel. And this, here's a couple of, whoops. This, just some feedback we get from our residents. You want to kind of walk through that a little bit? Yes. Um, these people mm -hmm. that um, come into our home are usually the families of the residents. And I know what that's like. If anybody knows what it's like to be emotional about a mom, my mom and I were so incredibly close. And without fail, it's such a relief to them to find this home. I just a few things like uh, thank you for the excellent care you gave my mom that she receives at Nana's Nana's place is such a blessing I specifically reached out to them to these people and ask and some of them are former residents some of them are current families that we have and they said actually they said they wrote so much stuff that we've tried to condense it here and they said give me as a referral i'm more than happy to you for you to use me as a referral so it's such a relief um for i 
I think some of you know what it's like caring for an aging parent. It's really, really hard. And when you go into these assisted living places and you see the lights up and down the hall, I can't tell you how many times I walked out in tears with my mom and realized I couldn't put her in a place like that. Um, but Nana's Place provides personalized care. Um, they are just emotionally and mentally such a relief to the families that come in. And really, we are, and the next slide I think shows us, we are truly like a family at Nana's Place. Truly, the, it, we're like extended family. We do Thanksgivings together. We have Christmases together. This is a shot of our three residents and two caregivers. So, and that's in the backyard. Um, but it's truly like a family. That's all I can say. Um, and um, so, so that's that's a, that's a long <laughs> presentation. But it's we're very passionate about what we do, the service we offer, the home we have. It's very important to us. We really want to get this ordinance passed. We will agree if you if you put the stipulation that if we should ever you know, stop the business or whatever, we'll, we will return it back to a garage. Thank you. Any questions? I was reading your, uh, your request and says, I think, I don't know, you said it's the state of Texas is requiring you to increase the number of residents. Um, could you? So the, uh, not, no. So the, let me try to answer technically correct. You are, you're allowed to operate a residential care home with three or less residents, unlicensed. So we, the fact that we have three in there today, um, we're up to four, but we have three in there that, that, that's totally allowed by the state of Texas. As soon as you want to go beyond that, you must be licensed. You can't operate as an unlicensed facility. So we were doing fine with three, but then we, with the demand, everybody's like, can we move our mom in? We're like, no, we're full, we're full, we're full. And so we decided, we kind of talked about it and asked my wife when her mother passed, because she was one of the three, if we want to stay in this business or not. And her heart's totally in it. She said, yes. So we kind of moved to that next level. Then we have to go to four. And at that point, we have to get licensed, which we want anyway, because that's just an extra, you want that, right? If you have an aging parent, you kind of want to hear, oh, yeah, we're a licensed facility. Even though what we do tomorrow won't be much different than what we do today, we do have life safety standards. We have sprinklers and all that kind of stuff in place. Um, but, but it is something that's very important. So we made that decision, we made the investments, and we we're moving to the next phase, which was the garage, and we discovered the ordinance and why we're in front of you today. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Can I ask, so why not just sell this current home and move to one that's larger? Um, you want we to can. take that? So we, that's, that thought's like in our head right now. What if we walk out, you know, 10 minutes from now, what are we going to do? And the option, we have two options. One is we're just going to go ahead and go back to our day jobs. Or B... We've got to go outside of Capel. We can't, Capel will not allow the model in Capel, right? We can't find a single story home that would allow us to have, you need about five or six residents to really kind of make it something that's worthwhile, right? So you can't, you can't accommodate that Capel with the garage ordinance as is. The other home, somehow they got past the ordinance, they were able to expand the, to the garage. They're, they, they'll be there for a while. But we won't. We'll have to leave. So your your residents are currently one per bedroom, I presume, and yes. you're not interested in. I mean, I don't even know the sizes of the bedrooms. Doubling up. Minimum ten by ten. Um, yeah. Okay. Up to I think our largest bedroom is twelve by fifteen. Yeah. Okay. So the state requires ten by ten space per per person. person. So gotcha. our bedrooms are like 10 by 12, except for the master. We could, we toyed around master. But, again, this is, we kind of like, we're sensitive. We live in Coppell. We're kind of sensitive to what the Coppell city is all about, right? 
if you were putting your loved one into a home, you want a private bedroom, right? It's going to be very difficult for us to say, why don't you share with a stranger? And, and, and there's not a need for that. I can tell you, most people that come to me, I get calls every week. Like, I think you'll see in here, senior living specialist, people do not want their loved one sharing a room. It's um, not practical either because it's, th these people don't sleep through the night. Yeah. There's one or two bathroom runs. There's screaming and yelling. Just wake up with, you know, whatever. And so you kind of need... For someone to get a good night's sleep, you kind of need to have that privacy. So just in Capel, it wouldn't really work um, to shut that place down and try to find a home that already has a garage or, you know, we, I guess we could buy out the other one, but it still leaves you with only one home in Capel. And, and you really need more than two. You need several more to kind of catch up to the need for people with, with uh, aging parents here in Capel. And there are licensing restrictions as well about the – the distance between homes. Gotcha. So that's the other thing we're dealing with. If we want to be in Capel, and I know this is more than you want, you're asking for. Like for example, my healthcare manager, she lives five minutes away from this home. I live five minutes away, it's, so it's the perfect location. Um, and I'm a real estate broker, and I know what the market's like in Coppell as well. I actually, I know what it's like across the country. And so why would you have to close down if the variance wasn't granted? Is it because you've spent so much money on the licensing already? And because, well, from his standpoint, I think it's more of that. Okay. From my personal standpoint, I'm the one that's out there in front of these people talking to the families, telling them I don't have a room available. And when you say you don't have a room available, it's like they've got an immediate need. So I'm the one that has to. And, and senior living calls me. I, I probably get two to three calls a week with needs from senior living specialists. That's a placement. And I have to tell them that I'm full. And, and when you see the people and then you come give them a tour and they have tears in their eyes, these are people that this is their last option. So would this... If, if the variance was granted, the garage space would definitely become a, a bedroom with a private bathroom? Or I thought you said something, so it might. So I guess I'm not understanding. How are you going to generate more money to stay open if you're not getting additional residents if you don't make this another bedroom? Yeah, well, we are definitely yeah. going to make it another bedroom. So it's, it's, it's going to be built out to a big open space. I can't really okay. point on this thing, but, but the, the right-hand side is a garage. It's going to be an open space that will accommodate two beds. Okay. All right. If we don't have six residents or five residents and just unused, we're going to multipurpose it. That's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, so we'll, he's saying we're if... We're talking about doing spa services, other things like that to kind of you know make this more of a luxury service uh, facility for the existings, but when we when she does give that call, because again, these aren't people like oh my, I think I need something in six months. Mm -hmm. This is someone's mother who just fell. They got yep. released from the hospital. They no longer are able to care for them themselves. They need twenty four seven care services today. So we get a call, want to know if they can move someone in tomorrow, and that's where um, that's the dynamics of our business, and so that's why you know. We kind of have to have, it's very hard because we get those calls several times a week and we have to turn them I'm the out. one that gets those calls, gets by the way. Calls. So that room's going to be, you know, we'll have the beds there. And these are hospital beds. These, so they're mobile and we can roll them around and they go up and down a lot. We'll have the beds there. So if we get that last minute, hey, my mom's being released from the hospital. I need some place to care for. Her. Great. We have a place. You can come there. And we'll use it for that purpose. If not, then we'll just push it to the side and we'll be able to, you know, turn that into a, a little gathering area, play cards, um, so forth like that. Gotcha. Those are all my questions. Thank you. So I have a question regarding the hardship. Is it, is it an economic hardship? I mean, I don't, it's, it's, it would be economic to you to run it with only three residents mm -hmm. yeah, with all the investment you've put in it. Yeah. Yes. We, we would not be able to run it 
given the investments we have. We've already put like 100000 on top of the price of the home. We have 24-7 caregivers that are around the clock that we would not be able to run that. Um, but again, we're also, from a city standpoint, it's one less home that you're already a deficit on as well. So the hardship's not just on us. We believe the hardship, so just no one knows about these because until you have that aging parent, we're off your grid, we're not on your radar. But as soon as you have an aging parent that has a fall or it becomes, un, you can't take care of them yourself, they can't take care of them, they have dementia or whatever, all of a sudden we show up on your radar and you need us tomorrow and that's what something Capel would be missing. So I think the hardship is both on us and on the city because you're really lacking that and with the garage ordinance it blocks other people from coming in and expanding and doing similar sort of services for for the residents here uh exhibit f is what you're proposing how to change the garage correct what is exhibit f uh three can led lights two bed yes, bedroom yes. so this would this would be a giant a large bedroom for two residents to share there you go it's right? Everybody else has their own room, but this one we've built for yes. two people to um, share. Yes. Now, the way we could do that is this would be the rest of the bedrooms are so small that they it's not built for sharing. Like, the people I give tours to usually say, I, I want my mom in just this one room. This would be a room that we could partition off um, while still meeting the state guidelines. It has to meet the state guidelines, but... We could partition it off so so they could have their own privacy. But if we had to take the thing down, um, we could do that as well. Great question. I want to add on to that because um, when we were looking at doing this, there's an architect that used to work for the Texas Health and Human Services named Fred Worley. I think there are people in the city of Capel that know this gentleman because he's pretty well known within the state of Texas. We reached out to him. He's helped us tremendously. He's gone through and told us everything we need to do. And he's the one who designed this plan. We said we need a plan where we can maximize some bedroom space. We wanted to get two bedrooms in here, and, but we want to make sure we meet the standards from Texas Health and Human Services. So he's the one who actually drew up this plan because there's no, it's physically impossible to put two 10 by 10 bedrooms in here. The, the garage width is 20 feet. So with the wall space and all that, we're a few inches short. His idea, if you'd see it, I don't know if I can do it, but there's a, this light doesn't show up very well, but yeah, it's, it's angled such that there's a space to the right and space on the bottom, and if the beds are on the top right and a bed on the bottom left, they really don't see each other. There's some privacy inherited by the shape of the walls and so forth. Even though it's one big open room, there's, there's walls coming in from the, if you look at the, the right edge of the wall, in the middle section, you see a short piece coming in, and in the bottom, next to the utility door, there's a piece coming up, and they kind of angle towards each other. Those two creative walls we came up with helps us meet the Texas guidelines for, for maximum or minimum width and allows us to actually put two beds in there, and when you, if you're in the bed, you don't see the other residents. You get a sense of privacy. We put a lot of thought into this. <laughs> you see, we hired the right people to help us co do this because we want to do it right because we don't want to we don't want to put anybody's lives at risk. Anybody have any other questions? I don't. Thank you. Thanks for it. Anybody else here to speak for or against? Please step up. State your name and address for the record. Oh, hang on a second. Please step up to the podium. State your name and address for the record, please. Uh, good evening. My name is John Pauley, and uh, I live at 806 Meadow Glen Circle. Um, and I, uh, Board of Adjustment members, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and uh, I thank you for your service to our community. Um, I've lived at 806 Meadow Glen Circle in Coppell since 1987. Um, and I'm speaking in opposition to this, uh, to allowing this requested variance for 800 East Parkway. 
Uh, prior to the meeting, I didn't know what the specific intent of the owner was as far as the use of the additional living space. I, I do now. Um, my guess was that he was going to be planning to build additional rooms for residents, uh, and I was pretty close on that. Um, the main issue I see with doing this is parking. Uh, I walk by or drive by 800 East Parkway uh, on a pretty frequent basis. I mean, I'm just uh, very close to that house, and I use Meadow Run as... Uh, often to get an exit the neighborhood. So I, I drive by that house uh, all the time. And uh, at times it appears to attract more vehicular visitors than other addresses in the neighborhood. Uh, this may be due to visits from delivery people, family members, medical personnel, or others since this is a business. My observation has been that there are vehicles typically parked on Meadow Run on the side of the house, sometimes for many hours. Allowing this variance would eliminate off-street parking at 800 East Parkway and potentially add more vehicular traffic to the streets around it if more people move into this residential care home because there will be more people coming to visit them, there'll be more uh, services, there'll be more medical personnel, etc. So allowing this variance would mean more parked vehicles on Parkway, Meadow Run, and nearby streets adding to congestion in my opinion. Uh, if approved, this would set precedent and make it easier for other residents or investors in the neighborhood seeking to convert garages to livable space, which would add vehicles to the street due to the loss of off-street parking. These homes in this subdivision were all built with rear entry garages to reduce the number of vehicles parked on the street to have a certain sight line on the street. So I see allowing this variance as setting a bad precedent that would negatively affect the design and appearance of the neighborhood by adding vehicles to the streets. Uh, I recently read on a prominent realtor website that when buying real estate in suburban neighborhoods, buyers most likely have come to expect off-street parking such as driveways and garages to be included in their purchase. Because of this, homes with only street parking options will likely need to be discounted in order to sell in a reasonable amount of time. Similarly, convenience aside, street parking is often seen as a detriment to the neighborhood's curb appeal, thus affecting home values of not just one property, but often many nearby. Um, if this is true, there's the potential for the variance, if approved, to have a negative impact on the value of the surrounding homes. So uh, to summarize, uh, allowing this variance would, in my opinion, have several negative effects on the surrounding neighborhood. It would add to the street parking and congestion. It would set a precedent that would encourage additional street parking and it would ultimately have a negative effect on the value and appearance of nearby homes and streets. Um, I thank you for your time and consideration of these comments and I'm available for any questions or follow up at this time. That was very thorough, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone here to speak for or against the proposed variance? Um, anybody on Zoom? Mr. Chairman, we did have some people request Zoom links. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have anyone on the line? Yes, we should actually have a Stephen Hill on Zoom as well as a Mike and Holly Fisher. Can they hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, Ms. Fisher, could you please state your name and address for the record? I'm Holly Fisher. I live at 801 Parkway in Capel. Okay, and do you, and I have to swear you in now, please. So raise your right hand. I'm going to trust that you are. Do you solemnly swear that you, the testimony you're about to give before the Board of Adjustments is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. Okay. Can we have your testimony? 
Sure. So uh, thank you for allowing me to come and speak this evening and participate in this uh, public hearing. Um, first, I would like to say to the owners of 800, I commend what you're doing in concept. I have elderly uh, parents that I've recently had to rehome, and I certainly understand and um, appreciate you trying to offer a special place for those who are older. Um, I think, unfortunately, from everything I heard today, um, I have a, a few things that were a little confusing to me and that I think don't necessarily qualify in this case for a variance. Um, one thing that was confusing to me is whether there are cur currently three or four residents. I think it's three, although I think I heard there were four bedrooms. And what I think I also learned today is that, and which was one of my questions, was that the way this has been allowed to be operating as a business and as a residential home is that there have been three or less people residing in the home until this point. So setting that aside, I think the main thing that strikes me is that it really is a question of business viability. And from everything I understand, the hardship of a financial need related to a, a business doesn't qualify for this exception. Um, and that that hardship um, was, was not created as a result of the property itself. It's a standard property with standard code requirements. Um, and that the qualification of a financial hardship doesn't apply. Um, so those are just my comments. And um, I think that's everything I have to say, unless there's some questions. Does anybody have any questions for them? No. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Is there anyone else, Ms. Secretary? Is there anybody else waiting to speak? Yes, uh, Stephen Hill here on Zoom. Hi, Mr. Hill. Uh, please raise your right hand and take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give to the Board of Adjustments is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please state your name and address for the record. Sure. Stephen Hill, and I'm at 736 Parkway Boulevard. Um, this uh, this property is uh, directly next door to me. I'm, uh, Meadow Run runs in between our two houses. And my, my main concern is um, with increased beds and increased patients, um, there will be increased activity. And there's activity over there all the time. Uh, staff does not park in the driveway. Staff parks on Meadow Run, and there's a car there every day, all day. So if there's if more staff is needed, there'll be more par more cars there. And there's always a car either out front or on the side um, at all times. And um, and then that's not and that's not even talking about the you know medical staff, family members that come by at all times. So I, I am concerned um, since there already is um, you know street parking. You're taking away two spots um, with this. I, I think that's the complete reason for the ordinance is, is, is both, you know, our, the neighbor's concern is that um, uh, you're taking away the parking and that's why the ordinance is there um, because um, there already is street parking all day, every day. And um, uh, with more patients and more staff, uh, we've, it will only increase. That's a, that's my main concern. Thank you. Are there any questions from Mr. Hill? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Ms. Thank Se you. Ms. Secretary, is there anybody else to speak? Is anybody else, would you like to come up to the... Well, you, if you have to, if you have any additional testimony, you can you can state your additional testimony. Thank you. So, just there's two questions I think asked. I just wanted to answer those. First was a lady, I think, across the street from the house. Uh, she had questions about the three residential people and four bedrooms. So just, just to clarify, we have four rooms in there today. 
We have three, actually two today, but we accommodate three residents. State of Texas allows you, this is what I was vague on earlier, State of Texas allows you to have three residents there, unlicensed. You can add a fourth if the fourth is a family member, and that was our case. The fourth it was my wife's mother, and so we had the four residents in there all within uh, following state guidelines, and then when she passed, we're now left with three. Um, so that's that's uh, um, to answer her question, and then to answer the gentleman on the other side of Meadow Lake. There, the our caregiver our caregiver staff won't grow any. We you know it's it's going to be four maybe six residents. Our staff model doesn't change, so there won't be any more cars coming or going, dropping people off or whatever. There's been a lot of recent traffic or a lot of recent cars there because we are doing the work necessary to get licensed. So we've had contractors there for the last several weeks installing fire suppression systems, installing fire alarm systems, adding handicap accessible uh, rooms and bathrooms and all that. So over the last few months there has been, but once we're past this phase, it will you know, anticipated that, you know, there will be occasional family visit and there'll be occasional uh, nurse, doctor, healthcare worker coming by as well. And again, there's ample space there. There's still two spots in the in the driveway as well. So we don't anticipate any more parking issues. And we answer the question on the residential with three, four, if the fourth one is a family member. So. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm about to close the, the public hearing and open it to the board for discussion, but I want to ask one last time, if is there any other testimony to be presented before the board on this issue? As there's not, I'm going to close the, the public meeting and open it to the board for discussion. Anybody have any comments? Mr. Chairman, I would just like an opportunity maybe to address the owners, if I, if I may. Sure. So, uh, you, you know, I want to commend you guys on the good work that you're doing, the needed work in the community, uh, you know, and in, in your need as a business owner. Um, unfortunately, as you may have heard when, when you came in, the, the scope of this board is, is narrow. Our, our duty here is to interpret the current zoning it's it's uh it's not to um it's not to grant based on some self-made hardship um which in this case um you know is the fact that you must maintain the current need for the garage and so um that's what we're going to be looking at that's all i have I just want to say I agree with you, Rhett. It seems like this is um, a little bit of a, a self-created hardship, um, and it also seems to be based solely on economic gain or loss. There's nothing about the current layout of the property or any physical attributes of the property that create an undue hardship. I agree. That that was the, my thinking along those same lines. Which is which is tricky because it's such a valuable need. I mean, the need has been demonstrated amply uh, for the need for this type of business and and in Capel and you know, but that's something that's not within our scope um, and not part of. I don't think it can be part of our consideration. So. Absolutely. But it's heart-wrenching. I am an aging boomer. Just saying. I was born in the 50s. I don't think I can expand on anything else. I, th I think I've, I've heard it. I think um, this, is, this is what makes this, this so difficult sometimes because cause you... Um, because you are supply, you you are presenting a, a valid need, but but um, the way the zoning ordinance is is written and and our constraints as on the board 
kind of make it difficult to uh, to some sometimes we can't tailor things specifically. We have to we have to basically protect the zoning ordinance unless unless there's something unique with the property. And I don't think that I've seen that tonight as far as a property hardship. Yes. Um, I move that the Board of Adjustment in this case grant the variance. Um, grant the variance from Section 12-12-4 of the City of Coppell Zoning Ordinance to allow the conversion of two-car garage into habitable space by eliminating the two required enclosed parking spaces on the property located at 800 East Parkway Boulevard, as requested by the owners, Jack Leathers. I have a motion to uh, grant the variance. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor of granting the variance, raise your hand. All opposed? Okay, the motion did not carry. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I have one question. Uh, it, it's the the, 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 the the board has already taken the vote. Um, thank you. Next item on the agenda. Where's my agenda? Okay. There's no more. Is there any other special business? All right. Board's adjourned. <laughs>